going to be like like we we read about it in scripture and then we have the tradition that we're all going to be floating around in white choir robes and clouds and stuff and on the same hand it says God is coming to bring forth a new heaven and a new earth so is it going to look like the mountains the mountains meet the beach that's really what I kind of think <laughs> but regardless of what it actually looks like Regardless of what it looks like, I can tell you exactly what it's going to feel like. Freedom and peace and praise and love all in one space. And sometimes that feels the opposite of what this world is like. And sometimes not. We get a glimpse of heaven, a glimpse of his kingdom come. But maybe it sounds a little bit like everyone's singing their hearts out without thinking about what they sound like and all of it going to God's ears, Jesus' ears as honey 
just like that song said. This song tells of a time where there was no hope and darkness filled the earth. But Sundays are coming and Jesus is here with us now. May we all give him praise together as we sing.
love that that song says that we join in with all of heaven singing holy, holy, holy. And when you read Revelation, it says that the elders and the cherubim and seraphim, all those angels, everything really that's there already is saying holy. And that word means set apart and perfect and unique and different. And we're not perfect by any means, but the one that we worship is. And that's why we sing holy, holy, holy. You know, currently down here in a temporary state, but one day for those in relationship with him, we sing it permanently and face to face. And so I hope that encourages you that you don't have to be perfect because you can't be, but there is one who is. And that's what makes this world, with this world and this life worth living. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. At this time, I would love to dismiss our Ridge kid and Clubhouse kids uh, with Miss Kristen. They can head toward the back. Y'all are going to have an awesome day. We have something special for you guys to create and put together. Uh, and I hope y'all have a lot of fun today. So, hey, good morning again. And uh, we just want to say happy Valentine's Day. Uh, I know that maybe you don't feel love, but you are. You're loved, and we're glad that you're here. Maybe today you're floating on cloud nine and in love, and that's awesome. We're happy for you. And maybe today you're a part of the Lonely Hearts Club, and that is okay. I was a member for 35 years, and I got you a gift only for the Lonely Hearts Club people. It's at the Next Step area. Would love to hook you up with that uh, before you go today. But either way, single, married, whatever, uh, we want you to know that you are loved, and we're glad you're here, and welcome home. So with our environments, really, today, if you're a first-time guest, we love that you're here. And if you have any questions about today, if you have any questions about uh, connecting with the next step, or maybe you have questions about what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus or becoming a financial partner or knowing more about the church, uh, you can fill out the connection card in the seat back where you're seated, or you can go to nrcc.church slash connect, fill out that digital card, and we will connect with you immediately as far as like next week or any questions that you may have we would love to help you take any of those next steps one of the things that we love about our sunday environments is we get to celebrate generosity like this church began in 2012 at the first campus and then we went to ashley academy for a year and we met in a mobile setup and we renovated this space which was a bowling alley and those financial partners made it possible for an environment like you're experiencing today to be real. So thank you if you are financially partnered with us. And I wanted to show you our three options. You can go to our app, Northridge One, uh, and give online that way. You can download the Church Center app and find our campus, become a financial partner that way. Or you can give in person with the box in the back and those envelopes. Uh, we love being able to bless others because we have been so blessed and one of the things that i'm thankful for that generosity provides is our partnership class just today i was looking at a family that were simply attending for about a year and they came to the partnership class and now they're actually leading and they're serving in their community group and they're sharing their god story like that is our hope for all of you that you would find out how god has made you and gifted you and then we just want to help equip you and see you become everything that God has called you to be. Our next partnership class is actually next Sunday, and it's got child care and lunch provided, and it's a great opportunity to hear the mission and story of our church, uh, to, to find out what your spiritual gifts are, uh, to really find where you could fit and plug in, and be a blessing to somebody else because we are blessed to be a blessing. You can sign up at the Next Step desk, or you can go to nrcc.church slash connect and just write partnership and you'll get a reminder email about that. But we can't wait because really with partnership, it's discipleship and discipleship is really you stepping into whatever next step God asks you to. It's a step of obedience. And, and sometimes that's what partnership is for some people. It's, it's a step of obedience to finding out who you are and how God's made you and, and how you can be a part of this family even more so. If you have any questions, let me know. I'll be at that desk after this service. And finally, hey, we're on day 14 of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. I know a lot of you have connected with me about God moving in your life and answered prayer. And it's been a sweet, sweet time. So we want to celebrate the final day uh, next Sunday at 630 with a night of prayer. Uh, we'll kick it off with some acoustic worship. 
and then we will go throughout this building with some prayer prompts and you know you have the opportunity to pray with people or to simply just pray and then we'll gather back and we'll share all the answered prayers all the wins all the blessings that God has provided over the past 21 days and so be sure uh, to connect with us at that time and I saw this quote and I just wanted to mention it today because prayer is so meaningful it says I cannot change the world you cannot change the world even prayer alone doesn't change the world only God can change the world however God uses prayer to change us and then God uses us to change our worlds so I'm excited to see all that's going to transpire and happen because we were faithful to seek God, pursue God, and, and pray and fast for those 21 days. I'm going to pray for us uh, before Justin, our family pastor, uh, kicks off our This Is Us series. Uh, Jesus, thank you so much uh, that you're the only one worthy of praise and honor and our worship. Thank you that in heaven right now they're singing All Hail King Jesus. And I really pray through our individual lives to whatever you're leading us to do or be, that there would really only be an audience of one and that how we worship you here would impact the lives of the people that surround us where we live, work, and play. And truly that our life says, all hail King Jesus and everything that we do and say. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. So, guilty uh, confession. How many of you guys have ever seen the show This Is Us? Anybody? Yep. Who has not seen This Is Us? I'm guilty, right? So I had some friends of mine <coughs> try to encourage me to see the show, and the first thing they said, it's so good, it's so great, you'll cry all the time. And I'm like, I'm out. I have no desire to sit and be upset in my living room when I'm supposed to be pursuing something that's going to make me not think or feel many emotions. I just want to chill. So I'm like, I'm not watching this. But I love the concept of that phrase and what it has the power to mean. And so I'm super excited um, to jump into this series uh, for the next few weeks called This Is Us. And it's, it's trying to learn how to put our life and love together for a purpose when we're in some of the most meaningful times of our life, whether that's singleness, dating, engaged, or married. And it's, it's something that for the past few, I guess few months, my wife and I have been leading a small group and we've went through this book called Single, Dating, Engaged, and Married. And um, that's kind of where the idea for these sermons came across. And so if you're single, if you're dating, you're engaged, you're married, or you know someone who is, then you'll appreciate this series. And so what I do is I try to come up with titles for each of my sermons that will help me remember them. So when I save them or different things. And so this one I called The Gift That Nobody Wants. And it got me thinking, like, how many times have I been given a gift that I never asked for, that I never wanted? Sometimes I've been given gifts that I dread, you know, by elderly people in my family who don't really know who I am. It's trying to be thoughtful. And so... I want you to think of those gifts. If you're online, I want you to think of those gifts, and I want you to type them down if you're watching with us so that I can go back and read them. But I was given a gift, well, multiple gifts, that I never asked for, that I never wanted, that I would have never dreamed of wanting, but I learned to appreciate. And you see, like, I grew up divorced, and so there's, there's not very many great things about divorce, but one great thing is you get four Christmases in my world. You had mom's Christmas, mom's family, dad, dad's family. So I'm going to tell you about mom's family at the end. I'm going to tell you about dad's family right now. Grandma, Carol, 
gives awesome gifts. There's like 70 of us. She never forgets a birthday. She never forgets Christmas. So I'm always super excited. When I was a kid, we got like matching Nerf guns. Like it was amazing. So as a newlywed, this is what I opened. Do you guys know what this is? This is a 31 bag with my name on it. That's floral. And I was shocked and confused when I opened this gift. I asked my grandmother if it was for my wife, Brittany. She said, no, emphatically, it was for you. I picked it out just for you. And then it was the gift that keeps on giving because it came with a cooler with our initials. Okay? I'm going to throw it down here. It came with a sunscreen bag, which we still do use. And it came with a blanket with my initials. So I can't even, like, sell it because my name is on it. I can't get rid of it. Like, it's, it's mine forever unless I give it to another Sorowski and then she'll know <laughs> that I didn't want it. I didn't ask for it. But I learned to appreciate this gift because, you see, my wife and I love the beach. We love going to the beach. It's something that brings us great joy. And so after we were newlyweds, I, I took my sweet beach bag that I loved carrying because it's floral in Hilton Head. And it's amazing. Like, I can't even lie. Like, no sand gets on it. It brushes right off. You can rinse it off. The cooler worked great. It had a handle. The sunscreen bag, nothing got in, but it kept all our stuff good. So, like, you didn't spray sunscreen and get third-degree burns. Like, this was an amazing gift that I never asked for, that I never wanted, and I learned to appreciate. And so I tell you all of that to say, Sometimes we're given a gift that we've never asked for, that we never really even wanted, but if we give it time, we'll learn to appreciate. And so what I want to do is I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I want you to pay attention and see if you can find the gift that nobody wants. Okay? So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we're going to read verses 7 through 9, and we're going to hop down to verses 32 through 35. This is what Paul is saying when he wrote, to the Corinthians, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one to another. To the unmarried and to the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, then they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Hop down. Verse 32 says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. The unmarried or betrothed woman, betrothed just means engaged, is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. So did you guys catch it? What is the gift that nobody wants that we all get? Right? Singleness. Yay. Thanks, God. Right? Singleness. And here's the big idea. If you're a note taker, this is what I want you to walk away leaving. I'm going to say it about a hundred times, so you'll get it. Your singleness is a gift for undistracted devotion to the Lord. Undistracted, undivided devotion to the Lord. You see, when I was a newlywed, there were a lot of things that I wanted as a newly married man. The 31 bag wasn't on the list. Didn't come close, wasn't on my radar. I had people at work that sold that, sold that stuff, and I was like, get that out of here. Like, I don't want your essential oils. I don't want your bags. I don't want your Tupperware. I did like Pampered Chef because I got this really cool cheese grater, but that's not important. That's a different, I mean, just shredded cheese just tastes so much different than when you buy it in the store. That's free. If you want to come over, I will shred you some Parmesan cheese like Olive Garden. But there, there were these gifts that I was given that I, I never wanted. I never asked for, but I really learned to appreciate. And I think that's what God is saying here. You see, my grandmother, she gave me something I would need in her mercy and her love and her wisdom. And that's what God's doing with this period of singleness. And so when I got this gift, it really started 
me thinking down this rabbit trail, and this is what I came up with. We, what we want isn't always what's best for us, and what's best for us isn't always what we want or desire. You see, my grandmother, in her wisdom and love, gave me a gift that I didn't see the value in, but I learned to appreciate. And Paul is showing us that God, in his love and in his wisdom, is doing the same thing with the gift of singleness. Now, when I grew up, I didn't grow up in church very often, but singleness was a lot of things, but it was never a gift. Did any of you ever, were you ever taught that singleness was a gift? I, I was not. It was something that I didn't want. I wanted out of very, very badly. And so I, I think of this like going to Christmas and my dad gives me this beautifully wrapped present and I sit here and I open it up and I'm like, oh, singleness, yay. Thank you, Father. And then I'm like, I know James, and it's like every good and perfect gift comes from above. And I'm like, did James lie? Like, is he April foolsing me? Like, this is not the gift that I wanted. I did not ask for singleness. I don't want singleness. And God's like, here you go. Here is this ordained time of singleness for every single person on the planet. And I'm like, oh, thanks, Dad. And so I started thinking, like, why would our loving God and Father give us this gift of singleness if we were created to be in relationship, if we were created to be in community. And then here you get verse 35. What did it say? Right? It said, I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. So if you look at that word restraint, I'm a very visual learner. So that word restraint is like literally putting a rope around your neck to choke you out. And what Paul is telling you, he's like, singleness isn't to choke you out. That's not the purpose. It's to promote good order and it's to promote what is appropriate and secure this undistracted, undivided devotion to God. So then, of course, I had to look up. What does this mean? Promote what is appropriate. And all that means is it fits a given context. So I'm going to give you an example. Halloween costumes are very appropriate on Halloween, right? You wear them, you dress up, you take pictures of your kids, you get free candy, you keep the ones you like, you get rid of the stuff you don't like. It works for everybody involved. However, if you go to a wedding next weekend and you wear a Halloween costume, it is not appropriate, right? You're going to get questions, you're going to get looked at, because the context determines the appropriateness. Does that make sense for everybody? So Halloween costumes are appropriate on Halloween, not at weddings, okay? And so singleness to promote what is appropriate. And so here's the cool thing. Paul, in the verses that we kind of skipped over, he lays down some of the truth. And I'm just going to give you a brief recap, recap, but I hope that you'll go back and read it and check it out because there's some pretty awesome verses. And so for us, single, dating, married, they're all important, but they're not the most important. In verses 29 through 33, Paul reminds us that our purpose is much bigger than relationships, right? He's like, man, your relationship status, it's important, but it's not the most important. And he says, man, time is short on this earth, and so we have something much bigger to focus on. And that is what's appropriate. That's the context that we're supposed to live in. He's like, and time is short, this world is on fire, and we should care much more about people on this planet who don't know and have a relationship with God than we care about our own relationship status. And so it got me thinking, there's a story in Scripture in John chapter 4. Um, if you've been doing this prayer and fasting with us, you read it a few days ago. And it's where Jesus meets this woman at the well. And it's one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. And... She's living a lifestyle where she pursues man after man after man. And Jesus comes and he meets her and he doesn't shame her, but he tells her what she's doing isn't working. And, you know, she was pursuing a relationship with man over a relationship with God. And she went after man after man after man trying to fill this void that only Jesus could. And Jesus tells her that, right? He's like, hey, I'm right in front of you. I am the thing that you've been searching for. Not guy number one, two, three, four, five, or six, the guy you are currently with. None of them are going to fulfill your needs. I am here, that living water, to quench that thirst. And so many of us in the room, or those of you who are watching online, can relate to this. Whether it's a person or a thing, we pursue something over God. Whether you're single, whether you're dating, whether you're married, 
that purpose for us is the same. Undistracted, undivided devotion to God. But we keep choosing something different. We keep choosing a person, a thing, and those things are distracting us from God. And we have to get this relationship with Jesus right before we ever get a relationship with another person right. And and I'm going to save you a lot of trouble as someone who works with young people, middle school, high school, college, weekly. If you will pursue Jesus before you pursue another person, you will save yourself a whole lot of pain. A whole lot of pain. Because if we're honest, right, true or false, dating is great. True. Sometimes. For a little while. And then it kind of goes bad and then goes good. But here's the full statement. There we go. I'm back in action. Dating is great, but it's also distracting, right? Dating is great, but it's also distracting. And so think about this. You come to church as a single person, and you are near someone who you find attractive. What does that do for the worship service? You're standing, they're singing your favorite songs, and you're immediately, do I go one hand? Do I go two hand? Is that too spiritual? Do I go down low? Do I go in the middle? Do I sway? Do I rock? Do I put deodorant, like the one-arm sniff? Like, maybe I better raise this arm because I don't really know this guy, but this girl is someone that I'd love to go out to eat with. And then, like, do my clothes match? Are these the jeans that have barbecue sauce? Or in my favorite life, like, I would touch, and then the person next to me's leg would touch, and I'd be like, in heaven. I'd be like, oh, I'm in a relationship. I don't, I'm going to, can I use this mic behind me? And so I would lean and I would feel so in heaven. My favorite, I remember this vividly, okay? And I could be weird. Like the girl that I had a crush on, I won't say her name because it was a battle. But our legs touched, sitting in youth group, our shoes. Like you can't even feel this, but I did. And I was on cloud night. I was like, I left youth group that night. I'm like, man, me and Carrie, you're dating. I told you her name. I'm like, we're in. Like, we are going to be madly in love. Like, we're getting married. Like, it's going to be great. Our shoes touched. You can't even feel this. But, man, dating is great. But it's distracting. And, and like that verse says, right, God wants our attention. He wants our undivided, undistracted devotion. And so in his wisdom, In his mercy, he ordained a period of singleness for every single one of us, right? No matter who we are, that's something that we all go through. And so that got me thinking, okay, because I'm I'm kind of a sarcastic person. If you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to literally try everything I can to do it. And so when you tell me this, I'm like, well, I can go to church with a girlfriend, right? I can come to church and I can do all of those things, and you're not wrong. But look at verses 32 through 34, Okay, what do they say? Anxiety comes with marriage or relationships. And so, guys, I got to talk to you for a minute. And then, ladies, I haven't forgot about you. I'm going to get you. Okay, so dating is great, but has distractions. And I need you to hear this because my wife's at this service. I love being married. Okay, do you guys hear this? I love being married. Okay, wife is sitting right here. I love being married. But, guys, When you get into a relationship, there's no more vegging out in front of the TV because this girl wants to talk to you. And she wants you to listen. And not only does she want you to listen, but it changes. She's like, hey, this is what's going on. And I'm like, oh, great, this is what you do to fix it. She's like, no, 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 no. I just want you to listen and tell me it's going to be okay. Okay? Next conversation. Hey, it's going to be okay. No, no, don't talk. Just listen. I'm like, last time you told me to just tell you it's going to be okay. No, I don't want that this time. So then she comes to me on attempt number three, and she's like, what do I do about this situation? I'm like, I'm passing. I'm not saying anything. I'm nodding. I'm just repeating the words back to her that shows that I was engaged in the conversation. She's like, are you not going to say anything? Nope. Nope. It might be okay. I don't know. I'm listening. And she's like, I know I want your help. No, I am not giving into this temptation, right? And And that is a crazy distraction, and they're all like that. There's no more playing video games. The last video game I played was Halo 1, okay? Halo 
One, yes, that is not a lie. And a Wii, because I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. Nobody even plays Wii anymore. We got it at this family because that's, that's my life. And so, guys, they, they expect these conversations, and they want you to be engaged, and you can't just veg out in front of the TV. Like, I have 30 minutes a day if I'm lucky, and I'm not going to watch This Is Us. I'm watching WandaVision, okay, because I need pointless, no thinking. I don't want to get emotional. I, I'm out. But see now, ladies, if you look at those same verses, here, here's the honesty, right? We're not clean, and we are hairy, and we are cluttery, and we will expect you to do things that our mom did for us that we're not even going to know about. And so you got to know that about us. We are confusing, Right? My house, if you come, and these college students can attest, there's dressers in every room. You know why? Because my wife likes a clean house, but she married organized mass chaos. And so our house has got junk everywhere. So I learned quickly that if it's hidden, it's clean. So I just bought dressers in our living room. There's a nine-drawer dresser. You know what she has in it? Nothing. My kids have one thing of school. I got eight drawers filled. One's empty because I know there's going to be new stuff. And I don't want her to throw it away, so I can just pop it right in that drawer real quick. The bad thing is my son's picked up on this. There's Legos under every couch. There's spaceships. There's airplanes under the couch cushions. Like, I am teaching my son how to be the greatest boyfriend, husband in the future ever. So if you're in the room, I'm sorry if he's yours. But that's just what we do. And so dating is great. Being in relationships are awesome. I love being married. But man, there's some distractions and there's some changes and it takes work. And these relationships, they come with different anxieties and different cares. And so all of that to say, they, they come with these different stages and these, these things. And what people typically do is we downplay the season of life we're in right now to bring up the season of life that is to come. And and what I want you to do is I don't want you to waste your singleness. I don't want you to miss the benefits of now by focusing on the benefits of then, because you were given a gift, a gift of singleness to pursue an undistracted, undivided gift or devotion to the Lord. And for those of you in the room who aren't single, this is still us, right? Don't waste the opportunities you have now. The purpose is still the same. Pursue God with this undivided, undistracted devotion to God. And so I started thinking about this again, like being single, you have a time of freedom. And man, that goes away when you get into a relationship. And then it goes away when you get married. And then it goes away when you have kids. Like some of our college students tell us all the time, well, you were so much more fun before you had kids. We were. You could come over at 10 o'clock at night and we were still awake. They would show up at our house and be like, we're going to go roll Anthony's house. I'm in. It's 1130. That's fine. I have nothing to do tomorrow. You come to my house at 1130 tonight, you better be dying. So I'm in bed. I got to work tomorrow. My kid was sick. Like, I got to make lunches. I got to make breakfast. Like, nope. And so there's this amazing thing that you have in singleness that goes away. And it's good. It's okay. Like, it's, it's a wonderful time. But I think... I think God ordained this time of singleness for a purpose. And if we can get this right, where we understand it's for an undistracted, undivided devotion to him, it prepares us for the next stage of relationships. And then we can lead other people to him. They see the hope that we found because we're pursuing Jesus passionately. And then we're able to share that with them. And so you're free for a purpose. Don't fill it with distractions. It's a gift for an undistracted devotion to God. And what's really cool, that word devotion, it means good at being beside. And so literally the picture of this is get good at being beside God, being attentive to his word, being attentive to his work. And that's an amazing thing just to sit and dwell at the foot of Jesus, right? Because then you're going to start seeing him more. You're going to pay attention to these things more. And what's amazing is when you're passionately pursuing God, people are going to be drawn to that because we all have that same void. And so the purpose of your singleness is to grow closer to him so that you can lead other people into a growing relationship with him. 
And so verses 32b, like the end, and 34, they define the purpose of being single. So if you're frustrated in your singleness, pay attention. I got this for you, right? The purpose is to please the Lord. The end of verse 32 says this, the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. And then verse 34, the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. And so you think about this, right? How to please the Lord. Adam and Eve. Before Eve, what did Adam do? Everything God asked. Name the animals. Check. Take care of the land. Check. What happened when Eve came? No more animals. He was distracted. Man, well should. He had a naked lady walking right towards him. Who's not going to stop working? I'm just being honest in church. Like, I, I can't tell a lie. My wife's embarrassed, but that's the truth. You saw a naked Perkin walking down the stairs. You can be like, I'm just going to keep sweeping. You should. We probably should, but I I can't lie. Like, I'd be a distraction. And so, Adam, we're with you. That's why we only have this many animals. He got distracted by Eve, right? And so, if we can be honest, all jokes aside, (laughs) my wife's like, please move on with this point. You can't say naked from the stage. Well, she was. She was. But many of us, if we're being honest, we long to be in a relationship. And I think that's normal. We were created to be in relationships. But if you look at your life, it's a train wreck. And I'm, and I'm not me and mean. I'm not making light of that. Like it, there are different things for different reasons that just show that you are not ready to be in a relationship. And it could be very similar to this woman in John chapter 4 where you pursue thing after thing after thing or person after person after person. And it's never going to fill you up. It's just going to distract you from him. And I told first service, like this was my life growing up. I I wanted out of singleness for a lot of different reasons. And so I tried, failed, tried, failed, tried, failed. And I, I just said, okay, I'm done. I'm out. I'm not doing this. I'm out. And started focusing on different things. And I'm not joking. I'm not lying. Like my wife was literally like walked right to me by one of our friends in college. And she was like, Hey, this is Brittany. Will you introduce her to some people? And I pulled an Adam and I was like, whoa, man, yes. Yes, I will love to. And so I found all the weird kids I could find in the room and I introduced them to her. So I would look better. I'm not even, I'm not even shameful. Like it's the truth. Like I found every weird kid I could find. I was like, hey, this is Brittany. And here's, I won't say any names because I'm a better person than I was when I was 19. And We talked for like four hours and I went back. This is not a lie. I sat on the couch and I said, guys, I just met my wife. And they're like, bro, shut up. You're at a Christian college. You say that every time. I was like, nope, game changer. And the story gets even funnier because I had talked to Brittany, not ready for a relationship. So I was like, of course, I'm not either. Well, one of my friends came. He's like, dude, I met this awesome freshman. She's beautiful. Her name's Brittany. And I was like, dude, go for it. Because I knew she wasn't dating nobody. And he was good competition. Like, he was good looking. He was funny. He was that loud. I was like, yeah, let's get this out of the way quick. I was like, go for it. Man, a couple days later, he came back. She ain't dating nobody. I was like, really? Yes. She's not interested? Nope, not interested at all. And I was like, yes. Went into the bathroom, like, had a little moment of prayer and worship. I'm like, still for me. It's for me. And what's, what's cool about our relationship, again, all jokes aside, we didn't date for a year because we both knew that we weren't ready for what was being asked of us. And we had a a good time. There were some bad times, but there were more good times. And we grew closer as friends and then dated. And now the rest is history. It's wonderful and it's amazing. And I say all of that to say, if you're frustrated in your singleness, it's because you're missing the point and you're missing the purpose. It's kind of like playing basketball with a football. I don't know how many of you guys ever tried to dribble a football, but it doesn't bounce. Mac told me he could do it. I'm going to call him out on that. He doesn't know that I know that. He was here first. He was like, I could dribble a football. No, you can't. So you you can't play, right? You throw the football off the backboard. It bounces every different way. It's going to get stuck in the net. It's just not what it's intended to do. And so if I use a football like a basketball, I could make it work sometimes, but it's not fulfilling the purpose for which it was created. And the same is true for us. God gave every single one of us an ordained time of singleness to pursue an undistracted devotion to him. And so singleness isn't just waiting for marriage as a purpose. And that purpose is that undistracted devotion. And so 
no matter what stage of life you're in, right, is we're going to hit these different relationship topics. You know people who are single. You know people who are in this period of life, and they could be frustrated. They could be down. Remind them of this purpose, right? If you are single in the room, this is your goal, to get good at being beside God. So as the band comes back up, I want to close with one more story. Okay, so I told you about mom's fam- or dad's family, so this is mom's family. I was the first grandchild. So for all the grandparents in the room, you know what that means. I was the favorite because I was the only, right? And you're still the favorite. Your parents won't tell you that, but you're the first. You're the favorite, okay? I'll be honest. And, man, this was awesome. This grandfather was loaded, like packing the money. So hundreds of dollars, boom, Christmas, $100, birthday, $100, random holiday, $100. This grandfather didn't know my name. He called me Jason. I didn't care. He was throwing me $100 bills, okay? Called me Justin, spelled the name wrong, didn't care, $100 in the card. Thanks, Grandpa. Appreciate it. Yeah, love you, Jason. Love you too, okay? And then my family had the audacity to start having kids. And so what happened to my gifts? They started shrinking, 50 bucks, 20 bucks. $10? $10? Come on, Grandpa, we know what you're good for. You own all these businesses and you're slipping us all $10? And I was mad as a young man. And then this hit. Do you guys know what this is? Oh, yeah, right there. You guys know what that is? Yeah, the old people in the room know what that is. For you young people in the room, it's a worthless piece of paper. Okay? So I got one of these. It said $500 on it. I was ecstatic. I was like, Grandpa heard my complaining. Took it to the bank. You know how much that thing was worth? 14 cents. She's like, sir, this has to mature. I said, what? It says $500. Give me $500. Oh, no, no, no. You have to wait. Uh, Excuse me? And then I got another one. And then I got another. I said, Grandpa, you can keep this 14-cent piece of paper. The the card was worth more than this. Like, I was bitter. And I was hurt. Like, this is a prank. $500 that you can't use for 20 years? What's the purpose? And so I just threw them. Like, I just threw them in a drawer, didn't keep them. Thankfully, my parents are smarter than I was. Thank you, Mom. She's probably watching. I appreciate you for keeping my savings bond. Because you fast forward, as a 20-year-old man, I moved to the great state of Tennessee from Indiana and went to a college that I had no idea was so expensive. And apparently, you need money to eat and buy gas and do different things when your parents stop paying for things. And so I had a, a rude awakening as a young man. And then I remembered that my grandfather, in his wisdom and love, gave me a gift that I didn't want. But boy, oh boy, did this 20-year-old man who loves Taco Bell learn to appreciate because those saving bonds had matured. And I had a gift that I loved and learned to appreciate. And so God, in his wisdom and mercy, has given each of us a gift. Don't waste it. with the head of my enemy you come back and you call it my victory was 
A lot of times we get into a mess. Maybe it's a mess that we've created, or maybe it's a mess that makes no sense that just happened to us. And we try everything to fix it, and we try to find the answers, and maybe we, like Justin suggested, if you're married, ask your husband for advice and to listen and to fix it, and then just shh. Or maybe you're just struggling on your own. Ultimately, God does not want you to walk this life alone. And so there are people gathered in this room. There are people that you can reach out to and connect with that say, hey, me too. Because being human is really hard. Because we hold this tension of being human and created in God's image and being God with us. Like he said, he's with us us, but we're here in this tension of what I want and what he wants is exhausting. And then you throw in extra elements that are beyond my own control and it gets to be a hot mess sometimes. The next song that we're going to sing, we're going to sing the word amen over and over again. we say it from the very beginning if you grew up praying even around the dinner table singing the Lord's blessing that you learned in preschool we always say amen we sing amen amen and it means let it be God you be God and let it be and that's really hard to say when you're in the middle of a mess it's really hard to say when your heart is broken when you're abandoned, when you're by yourself and isolated, and everything in between. So I challenge you this morning, just offer it bravely and say, amen, let it be. And may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations, in your family, in your children, in your nieces, in your nephews. His presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you, because He is for you.
children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. So, 
I just have to be honest for a second. I didn't get to share this first service because it didn't happen, but standing here singing that song with my kids and it became a little cry and then a bigger cry and then it became a prayer that I was singing to God over them and it made me think like, if we can get this right, the way that you live your life, the way that I live my life, there's a generation behind us watching And if we can pursue God with this undivided, undistracted devotion to him, they're going to see this. I could look down at my son and my daughter and say, this song is for you. God is for you. And I don't know where you're at in your life. And if you are single, sometimes it can feel overwhelming and it can feel like hopelessness and it can feel lost. And in the first song, we sang a, a line that said, your mercy is the shade I'm living in and you restore my faith and hope again. And so despite however it is that you feel, our hope and our prayer is that you know those things to be true and you live based on what you know. So as we leave this place, no matter where you're at in your life, pursue God with that undistracted devotion to him. We love you guys. We hope you have a great weekend. We will see you soon.